Hi, I'm Laurel Gillespie, Director of Advanced Care Planning in Canada Initiative with Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association. Today, we'll be having a conversation with Elizabeth Doherty. We begin this, conver uh, we begin this event, a conversation with, by acknowledging that we're meeting on the Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers to this land, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet today and thank all generations of people who've taken care of this land going back thousands of years. So in particular, in the National Capital Region where I am located today, I'd like to acknowledge it is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. So today we welcome Elizabeth Doherty. Elizabeth is a clinical social worker and educator with extensive experience supporting children, youth, and adults facing serious illness, uncertainty, and grief. After specializing in palliative care at the largest cancer treatment center in Canada, she started a community-based private practice supporting individuals and families of all ages from diagnosis through to the bereavement phase. Elizabeth collaborates on multiple initiatives advocating for greater access to high quality palliative and end of life care while teaching courses, seminars and workshops across disciplines, settings and sectors. So today we're going to speak about how to demystify advanced care planning. Today, we welcome you Elizabeth and joining us. Thank you so much, Laurel. I'm happy to be here and really happy to connect. Oh, it's it's so wonderful um, to host these interviews with people who not only are like-minded, but who are passionate about what they're doing every day and making a difference to improve quality of life for all Canadians. So I, I, it's something I really cherish and I'm really grateful, we're really grateful at Advanced Care Planning um, at CHPCA to have people like yourself who are, are willing to give of their time to share your insights and thoughts. So, I have a few questions that I'd like to, to go through and it's sort of just a casual conversation um, that we try to have with people. And I'm really curious to know that, um, how were you first introduced to advanced care planning in your career or just in life in general? Yeah, thanks for asking that, Laurel. Um, it's interesting. I think it's all about informed conversations, right? And, uh, you know, as a kid, I remember I was raised by my mom. Uh, my mom raised my sister and I on her own. And subsequently, in the midst of caring for both of us on her own, ended up caring for her mom in our home when she was facing end stage cancer. And I saw the impact on her as a caregiver, as a really busy single mom working two jobs, caring for her mom trying to navigate the healthcare system, but some of those conversations as well. And she's a sibling, she is, well, there were 12 of them in the family. So navigating those conversations as my mom was a primary caregiver for quite an extensive period before, you know, my grandmother faced end of life uh, and had an acute episode um, in our home and actually um, had to be rushed to hospital. And seeing those experiences really were impactful. Uh, the range of experiences were really impactful for me. And I think without realizing it really molded who I was and, and the career trajectory for me and seeing that experience with other family members as well. Um, uh, a cousin that I just adore cared for her son, young son after being diagnosed um, with a brain tumor and what his care experience looked like uh, and subsequently dying at home. So I think just seeing some family experiences navigating the healthcare system, but as a social worker as well, um, you know, inform conversations and trying to create spaces and places for people to share their values and wishes and, and explore that with them in a non-judgmental safe space with humility um, has always been part of what I've done as a social worker, whether that was in internships and corrections or child welfare, you know, working with folks who are experiencing homelessness on the streets of Toronto, um, you know, even working in an addiction residential treatment center, you know, for folks that were struggling with substance use and misuse, I think it was always about, you know, what are your values and wishes and how do we explore that? You know, also appreciating that people experience trauma, right? Prior to us meeting them, but certainly when we take a proactive approach to starting with what they understand and then exploring where they'd like to go from there, or exploring what their options are um, for service, for support, for care, and that was always impactful for me. And one of my internships, because I graduated with a degree in history after I quickly realized I was not gonna actualize my dream to be Indiana Jones. I wanted to go into anthropology 
So recognizing that was not going to come to pass. And I often say, you know, I recognize that I was drawn to history and to anthropology because it was the power of these stories that was such a draw for me. And I realized as I graduated with my degree in history that I thought, you know what, it's the stories, yes, but it's about the people behind the stories. So I went on to take a diploma in community work at uh, downtown Toronto at George Brown. And it was eye-opening for me in so many brilliant ways because the students in that program came from across the world to study in this place and work in Toronto with a multitude of lived experiences. And so working and living in that space and learning in that space was incredible for me. And one of the internships I had was in crisis intervention at an East End Academic Medical Center in Toronto and seeing people in the emergency department facing crisis. Um, you know, it was more a reactive approach in that moment to see how we could best support people. Um, and so after I finished that year long internship, I stayed on and volunteered for another four years. So I was in that capacity as I went on to complete my bachelor's and master's in social work. And when I graduated, I was hired in um, an academic medical center uh, in Toronto and um, in general internal medicine. And it was there probably within two weeks of working that I saw a really young woman be admitted after a catastrophic stroke. She was young, incredibly vibrant and healthy, no pre-existing conditions, experienced this catastrophic stroke and was unable to communicate for herself. And I saw her parents, her siblings, her partner at her bedside, and they were just heartbroken thinking, what do we do? You know, what are our next steps? Trying to process things so quickly you know, and yes, there's the medical piece, but certainly the emotional, the psychological impact certainly was just hanging in the, just the space, the trauma of it all for them. She subsequently suffered another catastrophic stroke and died. Um, and the family was just left putting all the pieces together or trying to, um, but it was, you could see they were guessing, right? What do we do? What would she want? And for me in that context, as a new grad, I thought, wow, you know, something that I'd seen before, but not someone so young, right? So I think it certainly destigmatized the fact that, you know, it's not something that only happens when someone is in their 90s, right? People facing these acute medical events. And I knew that to be true, but to be present for that, you know, to see the trauma for not only this young woman who was unable to communicate for herself, but also her family, I just really informed how I move forward in my practice. And you know, while it was something that was always on my radar, it really conceptualized it for me, you know, really crystallized it in that moment, those moments thinking, what can I do proactively for folks as they face their journey, whatever that journey is, whether they're, you know, being in healthcare, whether their illness is curative or not, whether it's chronic and long term, whether they're at risk of experiencing an acute event, or like Dr. Amy Tan, who I often draw people's attention to, right? These unexpected moments can happen anytime in the absence of complex or chronic illness. So how do we create spaces for people to explore their values and wishes? You know, beginning with first and foremost, what they understand, right? And then where do we go from there? And so that's just been a part of how I live my life. And I can tell you, you know, not long after that, when I got pregnant, um, I first thing I formalized was my will and my power of attorney. Although we'd had conversations before, it was formalized before my first child was born um, and revisited every way through. So I guess without naming it as advanced care planning, having informed conversations has always been part of my practice, but it's very much been informed by the places and spaces I've been honored and privileged to be present in with families throughout their journey in healthcare. Um, and certainly moving on from general internal medicine, I was there for just short of a year. I knew probably within a couple months of being there, I wanted to create greater spaces to explore the psychosocial impact of illness and grief and loss and dying. So I moved to psychosocial oncology and then thankfully with an infusion of funding, the start of a new palliative care program at the largest academic um, cancer treatment center in Canada uh, it was the first social worker dedicated and appointed to the team. Um, and it really gave me an incredible space to explore that with families of all ages and what it meant from them and how we could best support them going forward. That's such an incredible story. And I, I love how, you know, a thank you for sharing um, some of those um, very, what must have been very trying times for you as a child, not only just growing up with, a, you know, a single mom, I've been in that, that uh, position as a single mom for a few years now, and, and it's tough. And I, although I've had my own personal experiences of dealing with cancer diagnosis and caring for my mother-in-law at the time for six and a half years who had Alzheimer's and raising kids and so on and so forth, um, 
it's really quite something how those lived experiences can really help to shape you as an adult. So I really appreciate you sharing that, um, Elizabeth, with us. And But I'm so grateful that you were able to find something out of a silver lining, if you will, through your mom's, um, I don't know quite the right word, through her sacrifices that she made um, in order to care for her own mom and raise two, you know, successful um, individuals at the same time. So hats off to your mom being a strong woman and then supporting you and, and your sibling um, and fulfilling your own dreams. But I love how through that lived experience, you found something that you're really passionate about and then, you know, just trying to share and do what you can to help others. Um, that's extremely, um, extremely rewarding at the same time. I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, for your mom having led you in, in that direction and, and having had a part in that but good for you that um, you've got so much experience and and just such what seems like a very short period of time you've just done so much incredible work and you know your name is um, within our our sector in advanced care planning everybody knows who Elizabeth Doherty is like you're here you're quite something and everybody speaks so highly of you so thank you for sharing um, that about your background with advanced care planning and everything that you're doing and I think you hit on one particular point um, about it that moment when you were involved in the care of that young girl that had suffered, you know, two successive um, um, strokes, that, you know, it's about normalizing that conversation, that advanced care planning, that it's not a dirty word. It's, it's not something that should be swept under the rug. And in fact, if people really understood what it is or have a greater understanding of what it has the potential to do for you or your loved ones, in the time of crises, when you need it most, um, more people would be engaged. And that's one of our goals um, with what we're doing is normalizing that conversation and encouraging people to just start talking about what ifs and what's important to you. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to get there one day that it, it's going to be as natural as you know planning your estate, doing your, your um, financial planning, and, and looking at your healthcare needs, and we don't have crystal balls. We don't know when something tragic is going to happen to us. And that's really not the ideal time to think about, you know, the what ifs. And I like to kind of surmise it to be that, you know, advanced care planning is really, it's not about end of life care. As much as it is, it's not. It's really about how well do you want to live and what kind of quality of life do you want to have while you're still alive, <laughs> right? And if you're not able to voice what you desire, who's going to do it for you? And at what point, you know, when and, and what sort of, if you were, you know, you don't have to have all the answers in the beginning, but start having the conversations with your nearest and dearest and, and, and go on for the, from there. So I'm glad that you're out there doing that work and um, as a social worker and an advocate um, and a support person to families and, and right through to the bereavement, bereavement and grief um, phases. That's important, so important too. And I'm, you know, I worry a little bit for the future. It weighs heavily on, you know, the impact, the long-term impact of what we've been experiencing in the last year is going to have on, on individuals who've had to experience tremendous loss this year in a number of different facets in their life, not just with losing a loved one, um, but other things as well. Um, so uh, the second thing we're kind of curious is, so you're, you're very involved with the advanced care planning initiatives and um, you know what, you kind of already answered it as like what drives your passion and involvement um, for sort of um, being engaged in advanced care planning, but um, can you talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that you're currently involved in that are helping to demystify what advanced care planning is and to help educate people about it? I'd, lo I'd love to hear more about what you're doing in particular. Sure. sure. Um, well, so I left uh, the academic, well, the tertiary care center I was working in in 2015. And um, while I was incredibly grateful to be at such a large teaching center to work with so many disciplines. And really it wasn't until, you know, the parallels, obviously, I mean, I know the parallels are clear between advanced care planning, 
you know, and palliative care, but coming back to more of what you were just saying, it's about the quality of life, right? Um, and that often isn't explored or talked about till someone's actively dying, sadly, right? So for me, you know, I had the benefit of, you know, the other really brilliant part that I saw was that interprofessional collaboration and blending of roles um, and how we could support people in those contexts. So when I left um, that palliative care team in 2015, uh, with my roots in community work, I wanted to see how I could explore options on my own to see in my own community because I saw families coming to the hospital from across Ontario and they look to return home and say, who do I talk to when I get home or what other supports available? Um, you know, whether they had young kids that they were wanting to talk to throughout the process, you know, if there was an incurable illness, for instance, or life limiting illness. Um, but moreover, just helping to navigate the system. So I started, decided to start my own practice, um, thinking that I, you know, yeah, I also consider myself a lifelong learner and that I know it's always learning, unlearning, relearning and continuing that cycle over and over again, which is part of what inspires me. Um, but in the process of doing so, I thought I, you know, I've had the brilliant experience and exposure being a part of the system, um, you know, starting back in that internship role in crisis intervention and emerge, you know, back in, you know, 1993. So 94, um, I thought, what can I use with that experience and go forward to create something in the community while also collaborating with my colleagues across discipline settings and sectors. And that's what I've gratefully been able to do. So I have a clinical practice where I support folks from time of diagnosis, whether that's ALS or whether that's cancer, um, certainly a big part of that is helping them navigate the system because sadly, as we know, so many specialties and programs can be siloed and not communicate. I mean, that's true certainly for electronic medical records, let alone you know, communicating with another specialist who's following someone with a complex illness. Helping people navigate their expectations has been a part of my clinical practice, um, You know what to expect and their goals. But the other part of that as well is in addition to, you know, supporting folks that I'm, you know, connected to in my private practice, um, it's been the collaboration with colleagues across settings. So uh, I'm grateful to be a facilitator with Pallium Canada. So facilitating um, the LEAP courses, um, learning essential approaches to palliative care has been a really exciting part of that ongoing, you know, collaboration with disciplines across settings and sectors demystifying not only palliative care, that palliative approach to care, that it's so much more than end of life care. Um, in fact, sadly, when we wait until end of life, as you know all too well, Laurel, that there's so much avoidable suffering that happens, right? So um, LEAP is something I've been honored to be a part of since 2015 when I became a facilitator. Um, and then in my own community here, uh, I teach fundamentals of hospice palliative care. So that's, uh, I'm just west of Toronto. So that's to Halton and Peel regions. And that's also uh, different disciplines working, whether they're in acute care or hospice care or long-term care. Not only is it demystifying palliative care, but we talk a lot about advanced care planning. And it's interesting, whenever I ask healthcare providers, you know, how often or have you witnessed, uh, you know, a family caring for someone? And, you know, I often use the experience of end of life because quite often, sadly, that's when palliative care is referred, if at all. Um, I often ask them, you know, have you had the experience of caring for someone when you know, something suddenly happened to their, their person and they weren't able to communicate for themselves and the family was at a loss for trying to navigate next steps and the practical, the medical aspects of that, let alone the psychological and emotional, knowing what that tension feels like is so palpable when you're caring for a family in that space, in that place. And without doubt, without a doubt, of course, everyone, you know, acknowledges, yes, I've been in that experience many times caring for someone like that. And then when I follow up asking, you know, without judgment, and I frame it, you know, without judgment, can I ask you, you know, have you considered for yourself, you know, your own advanced directives or, you know, the process of advanced care planning, and by and large, many of them will acknowledge they're not quite familiar with it, or what it means, or the resources, or even how to start the conversations. Um, so it's a really great way, even in that fundamentals of palliative care course, to talk about and demystify advanced care planning, not just for the care providers, but also then how it translates to the care they're providing. Um, so those two educator roles have been a really active part of my practice since I left the hospital in 2015. But in addition to that, the community worker in me is, um, you know, I actually run something called Death Cafe. 
which, you know, many people hear death cafe and they think, wow, how morbid. And much like palliative care, I think people don't realize how it's so much about celebrating life and living. And that's the point. And I think much like the care that I've provided in, you know, the healthcare system for all these years, when we create spaces for people to be open and honest about their questions and their fears, they'll willingly share them. Um, and that's what Death Cafe is about, is really sharing questions. Many people come forward saying, my family member had this horrendous experience and I don't want that to be my experience. So I want to explore what's available. So Death Cafes are a social franchise. Anybody can look them up online, download sort of the tools um, to host their own. And it's not pushing any services, but I always host the Death Cafes tied around significant days like Advanced Care Planning Day. I always joke Hallmark, of course, doesn't have a card to mark the occasion. So many people don't know about April 16th, but I would often hold a Death Cafe around Advanced Care Planning Day and share resources and information as a takeaway. And that would be kind of framing the, you know, the theme of the evening for the Death Cafe and those conversations. So people not only came in learning more about Advanced Care Planning, many of them have the lived experience with it already without realizing that's what it was, especially when things went awry. Um, but then, you know, going forward, it's how does this resonate with you? And here's some free resources from Advanced Care Planning in Canada that you can take with you. You know, as I was mentioning our conversation just before we got started, Laurel, that I refer to those resources across provinces and territories all the time for folks, right? To go to credible evidence-informed sources to start those conversations for themselves. Um, so Death Cafes are something, it's a volunteer initiative of mine. I refer to it as a compassionate community initiative really connecting with people in the community. Um, but the other thing I do is I was grateful to be appointed as an adjunct assistant clinical professor with the Division of Palliative Care at McMaster after I left the hospital. Um, so that's another role that I hold. And I had the brilliant privilege of being connected to jo Dr. Joshua Shad um, and the incredible faculty and team um, with the Division of Palliative Care. And Alan Taniguchi, Dr. Taniguchi is a legend. Um, it was his initiative, uh, really that he started a reading initiative to kind of create spaces for people to have conversations through books that explored topics around illness, grief, loss, and death. Um, so we renamed the project and I was grateful to join the project called the 100% Certainty Project Death, something to talk about. And we started hosting community events um, really with those books as a central theme around, you know, whether it was dying or loss or whether, you know, it was around the illness experience and that experience for families and caregivers. So we started hosting community free community events, um, you know, and those community events, much like the Death Cafe, I would hold would be tied to events uh, in, in the calendar year that people might not be familiar with, like, you know, Children's Grief Awareness Day, which we just had just a couple of weeks, which happened to fall the same week as National Bereavement Day. Um, so really, again, the whole idea of providing free resources and information about these experiences and where people could turn to if they wanted to learn more, because I appreciate it's not pushing the message, but really planting seeds to create opportunities to say, how does this resonate for you and for the people you love and what would be helpful for you going forward? I mean, I, and I think that's really where it starts, right, is, you know, those, the 100% Certainty Project was also, you know, a, a collaboration of free community events that we held together. Um, we actually held a death cafe specifically for healthcare providers and health science students. Um, we had 75 people register. Um, the thing with death cafe is you have to provide some element of food. <laughs> Usually they say cake and tea because uh, yeah, it started, it started in the UK, but we uh, ordered gourmet pizza that night at McMaster and had close to 75 people. But it was brilliant to see every, every discipline, including folks from, you know, the funeral sector. Um, coming together to talk about the impact of being there for others, you know, reactively often when people just didn't have that space to explore those conversations, but how proactively together we could look to create initi excuse me, initiatives or opportunities or just simply have informal conversations with folks to say, you know, what do you understand and how can we best support you going forward, better understanding your values, you know, your goals, and how do we bring together the people you love? I think always recognizing that family is best defined by the person, whether family is a parent or sibling or partner or a cherished neighbor, right? And I think that's where that substitute decision-making uh, part and conversation is really handy, especially when it comes to power of attorney. Um, you know, so people are really aware 
that it's not just your eldest child because you know you trust them the most, but what those formalized processes can look like, and especially here in Ontario, right? What that legislation means, uh, you know, in terms of who would make the decisions for you if you were unable to. So I think a lot of people are surprised by that. But all that to say is those are some of the things that I'm doing in my practice. But it's so you're just doing so many wonderful things. <laughs> right off the top of my head, I want to wish you congratulations on your appointment um, as adjunct professor at uh, McMaster University. That's quite something, and they're really very fortunate to have you as part of their team. Um, the death cafe things, um, we've been following that quite closely, well, since I started um, in 2019 with CHPCA, and I really love the concept, and I think it's really important that it draws to a particular um, audience. I think mostly, I, I'm going to make the assumption that they're younger people um, that it draws to, and this kind of leads me into saying that as much as I, I, I admire and um, think it's so incredibly important to educate our healthcare professionals and our clinicians about advanced care planning and how to have those discussions and conversations with their, their patients that they're caring for, I think it's equally as important, if not even um, more important, well, not maybe not more important. I think it's equally important to encourage individuals to take some responsibility for your own body. So in that, I, and if I can expand on that a little bit is that in my experience and I, and I worked um, in a cancer center for uh, eight and a half years with some tremendously dedicated uh, medical oncologists and um, I admire them so greatly. And this was after I went through my own um, experience with the cancer diagnosis, but um, I found that one thing that I, I thought was that needs to shift somewhat is that we can't burden our healthcare professionals with the onus of making them the ones that are responsible to ensure that people do this. I think individuals need to have some autonomy over, you know, what they want their care to look like. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's unfortunate that, um, you know, people experience barriers to having these conversations, whether it's, you know, the individual understands the importance of having these conversations with their loved ones or their nearest and dearest, but yet maybe it's the, the loved ones and nearest and dearest that are reluctant to have these conversations because you stir up these emotions about a sense of loss. And that's kind of, you know, what I personally, in my personal life with losing both of my parents within a few years, and as the youngest of eight, it's kind of like you're left with all these questions of, is that what she wanted? And what were her favorite flowers? And did I make the right decision? And when people understand that when someone engages in advanced care planning, you may not have all of the answers, you may not have been provided, but at least you're given some idea or it reduces some of the burden of having to make some very, very hard, highly charged emotional decisions that can have long lasting impacts and you know has the potential to tear apart families if someone doesn't make the right decision and I just see that this is by people in, engaging in advanced care planning it's a win for the individual it's a win for the families and loved ones or you know those who are nearest and dearest it's a win for the healthcare professionals um, and it's a win for the administrators and those um, who are charged with having to you know provide care um, when as you mentioned briefly that often sometimes people will experience unwanted or suffer um, extensively because maybe they didn't want treatments to be carried out at a certain point and then they, they end up going through you know this test and that test and they maybe weren't ever really wanted in the first place so you know it's I'm grateful that we have the opportunity that um, in this country with our universal health care system that we do offer palliative care but it's it's sad that it's not often offered um, consistently enough across the country and not always at the right time um, to the right individuals and in the right places. So I know there's lots of room for improvement. So I thank you for like everything that you're doing to try to encourage people to engage in the process of advanced care planning, even if they don't get it 100%, you know, start somewhere and at least communicate with someone about what your wishes are and, and it's un also unfortunate that people don't understand that hierarchical system. And, and I will refer to, um, you know, the Living Well Planning Well document that we have 
on our website that it's about accessing your rights and each province and territory is different with the exception of none of it because they don't have any legislation yet around um, advanced care planning and, and personal care for health care needs. So it's important to always refer to your specific province and um, but people don't often understand that if you don't have someone designated to speak for you, somebody's going to be chosen for you. And it may not be the person that you would hope to be uh, making some very important decisions. Um, so uh, I guess the, the next question um, that we had for you, and I guess you still you kind of touched on it a bit already. Um, but what motivated you to step away from working at the largest cancer treatment center in Canada to start a community based private practice, supporting individuals and families of all ages from diagnosis to bereavement and um, and how was how did ACP play a part in that and, and so you kind of touched on a few things. But maybe you can also talk about, in your opinion, Elizabeth, um, because you did answer a bit of that question already, but maybe a second part to that was, what do you see as the greatest barriers to people engaging in advanced care planning? If you wouldn't yeah. mind. Thanks for that, Laurel. Um, you know, it's interesting. I think we see it personally and professionally. Um, my two best friends I've had since high school. <laughs> Um, I can't even talk about what I do uh, because they get really quite, uh, when I say emotional, I know a lot of people use the word emotional and that really doesn't tell us anything because joy is also an emotion, right? But they get quite upset um, be, and, and feel some, somewhat anxious because it's just like, I don't wanna talk about any of it, right? I don't wanna talk about anyone I love, let alone me getting sick at some point or being unable to just be able to communicate. So let's not talk about any of this. So we have an agreement. And again, I think it comes back to the work, right? Respecting where people are at. I know my two best friends, you know, on the planet that I've had since high school know what I do, but we just can't talk about it. Um, you know, conversely, my mom, who was an, and is an incredible role model, still working full-time at 75. Um, she normalized these conversations for me when I was very young, all of it about illness, about dying and death, um, about grief and loss. And so seeing that whole spectrum of how it experienced, people experience it differently. Um, you know, I was grateful to be able to be a part of that at, you know, the largest cancer center in Canada and worked with an incredible team, um, an incredible team of, you know, really different disciplines and seeing that blending, uh, coming together of their different experiences and expertise to support families was extraordinary. At the same time, seeing families often in crisis, often these were reactive conversations we were having, not proactive. So thinking about how we could upstream, try to educate and inform more, recognizing I think that stigma is there, right? That elephant in the room, I often joke that there's a herd of elephants in the room for all kinds of reasons. You know, how do we meet people sooner um, and explore their understanding, but really just normalize, you know, I've, I've had many families in my practice, private practice, even a family member I was advocating for personally, who I just saw there was so much physical suffering in hospital after a di synchronous diagnosis of cancer, uh, two cancers, and so much physical pain, but there was so much, I mean, as we know from Cicely Saunders, um, total pain. And, you know, educating them, there's actually a palliative care consultation team in your hospital, you can ask for that. And when they asked, they were told, oh, don't talk about that. You're not ready for that yet, right? And this honestly is the biggest part of my role is demystifying even what a palliative approach to care is, right? Um, letting people know what it means, the breadth and scope of what we can do together is multiple disciplines coming together to support folks from time of diagnosis. And I guess what was so impactful for me being at that cancer center is when I was meeting people, you know, so many people think of loss as being intrinsically tied to dying and death. And I was meeting people that had suffered a myriad of losses because of that life limiting illness, but they'd not been named as loss or grief, but they'd subsequently carried them and thought, why do I feel so broken? Like my person's alive, we're here. Why do I feel so broken, right? Why do I not feel like I'm coping? And their losses, multiple losses that had, you know, all non-death losses, whether it was mobility or fertility or employment and income, whether it was social connections, I mean, the list goes on and on. You know, those losses often weren't named. So um, exploring that, creating a space for people to explore loss and grief, non-death losses and the impact and how they would grieve that as individuals, but as collective, whatever that collective meant for them. Um, and then caring for them as they go forward, really exploring 
first and foremost, what do you understand, right? Because the number of people I meet and the thousands of families I've met over the last 27 years or so, um, you know, they say there's so much to take in. And I've heard many people say it just becomes a ringing in your ears as you're being told this information. So trying to process it and then make sense of it is so much to take on when, you know, as you've already said, the healthcare system, especially now, is so overburdened, right? So how do we support healthcare providers to support those they're caring for when there's so much to discuss, so much to take in? Um, so anyway, all that to say is that's been a big part of my role going forward is really looking at, first and foremost, what do people understand? I often refer to it as the three W's after that, you know, wonder, worry, and wish. You know, what are they wondering about really gets to questions they have about their care um, or in the case of caregivers, you know, what questions do they have about their person's care, whether that's their partner, their parent, their sibling, whoever it might be. So I always start with first and foremost, the understanding. And then, you know, what are you wondering about? Appreciating some of those questions we can answer. Some of those questions we want to refer to another member of the healthcare team or specialist. Um, you know, but some of those questions we can't answer, right? Like when people are asking about prognosis or what will this look like? But at least we can wonder in those spaces together, right? Um, doing the best we can to answer to the best of our ability. And I think really that's what it comes down to, right? How can we best show up to support people in this place? So I think exploring questions as this is all, you know, a process, these series of conversations, um, what are they wondering about? And then, and then next, what are they worried about? you know, gets to people's fears and my gosh, like, you know, they think of the people we connect with and so many of them have had traumatic experiences through friends or family where someone has really suffered immensely, greatly, and that has been so impactful for them. So often I'll hear, you know, I'm worried I, this, you know, pain might be, you know, insurmountable or I'm worried I'm going to lose the capacity to make my own decisions, whatever it might be. How am I going to care for my kids? right? Like whatever it might be, exploring fears for people as well gives us a space to, you know, discuss what supports are available. You know, what can we bring in to address some of those fears or potentially alleviate some of those fears? And, you know, how do we communicate and collaborate with others in the process to try and wrap around as much support as we can for folks wherever they are in that experience? Um, you know, and I see that a lot with kids and teens. And I saw that a lot when I was in tertiary care when the parents would look to me and say, I don't know how to tell my kids whether that diagnosis was curative or whether it wasn't. And I think that was one of the biggest burdens I saw families struggle with. And I stepped forward with really humility thinking, you know, I'm not always gonna know what to say and do, but I will not be afraid to care. You know, I will let that lead me and guide me and follow their lead in the process. So I think having informed conversations with the people they love um, and conversely with caregivers wanting to communicate with the person they're caring for especially when those fears are so prevalent. And I hear that a lot from kids and teens saying, I don't want to tell my parents because I don't want them to worry. Or I hear the parents say, I don't want to tell my kids because I'm pretty sure they don't know. And I don't know how to break this to them. In fact, I just actually had a referral a couple of weeks ago from a family after being diagnosed to be sent home for end of life care. And the parent I spoke to said, I don't know how to tell the kids that their parent is dying. You know, my partner's dying. Uh, I have no idea where to begin. And, and this was all remote. They're located in a different city than I am. But we navigated that conversation together really about having a compassionate and informed conversation about what was next and creating a space for their young kids in elementary school to talk about their fears in that context. And certainly, you know, the questions they had, what they were wondering about for, for themselves, for their parents, especially as their parent was dying. But the last W I come to is wish, right? When we talk about goals, you know, what is someone wishing for? And in almost three decades in healthcare, those wishes are, you know, small, but meaningful and incredibly extraordinarily, you know, meaningful and, and on a larger scale. But I think if we don't open up that space with people to say, what are you wishing for? We don't know, right? And some of those things we can help support. Some of those things, like I talk to the kids and teens that I work with, it might be like, you know, I wish I could have pizza for dinner. <laughs> but, you know, when I was working in the hospital, I remember I was caring for a woman who was facing end of life. And I said, what are you wishing for in this moment? And she said, I wish I didn't have to drink tea out of this stupid hot plastic mug because it just tastes like plastic tea. <laughs> and I love tea. I wish I had a proper teacup. That was the easiest fix on the planet. I literally went and got her, you know, a mug from the staff room, brought it back. We made a cup of tea and she said, oh. 
Like it was just such a small thing, but such a meaningful thing. Or even in the hospital, as I mentioned, you know, working with a young teacher who her plan was to go home and they'd always, she and her partner, also a teacher would travel across the country with her kids. And she wasn't able to because her disease was advancing so quickly. And I said, what are you wishing for in this moment? And she said, I wish we could have gone camping one more time. And the cancer center I worked at had a rooftop garden and the palliative care unit overlooked the rooftop garden. And I said, is it a trailer or a tent that you have? And she said, a tent, why do you ask? And I said, would it fit out there? Pointing, cause she overlooked the rooftop garden. And she said, yes, why? And I said, um, is there any chance if I explored some options, you'd be curious and interested in maybe having a sleepover with your tent and your family out on the rooftop garden? And she said, of course, that would mean everything to me. So I quickly went and spoke to the team, which then subsequently led to talking to hospital security. But all that to say is we were able to, as together, as a massive team, and I mean like not just the healthcare team, but security as well, arrange for this family to have private access to the rooftop garden for a sleepover with their tents, right? And I said, you know, it's not a marshmallow roast with a fire, but maybe having marshmallows over a lantern, you know? So all that to say is for this woman and her family, that wish was extraordinary. So I think coming back to what people are wondering about, worried about and wishing for, you know, starting first and foremost with their understanding in that given moment, because we know it's a process, things change. That's a big part of what I do. Um, at the same time, acknowledging the impact of these conversations and the losses they're experiencing at the same time, right? That we know that there are death-related losses, but there are so many non-death losses that people experience that aren't acknowledged and named and supported. So I don't know if that answered your question, Laurel, but I think that certainly has informed where I've taken my practice um, from being at the hospital and looking at supporting families of all ages in these spaces and places to have informed conversations about what to expect and what was important to them. Even integrating legacy work into that, some really creative legacy projects and being in a city like Toronto, you know, unfortunately I only speak English sadly, but I had the benefit of interpretation. So, you know, I did legacy work with families facing end of life when we spoke a different language, but I could use an interpreter either in person or language line um, on the phone and doing, you know, legacy work with them together as they were facing their final weeks and days um, was extraordinary. So they could come together and share what they were wishing for and what they were hoping for, honoring that space together. So. Anyway, that's what still propels me forward is what I still do. And like I said, now, because of COVID, there's so many non-death losses, but the care that I offer now is virtual. So still doing this with families. And in fact, that family that I was caring for, we did a legacy project um, online. It's, I call it making hugs. I didn't come up with it, but my colleagues in the community did, the Dr. J Children's Grief Center. Shout out to Kelly Eaton Russell. Um, and it's uh, tracing your outstretched arms on a bed sheet a white bed sheet. And the reason it's white is because you trace the arm outstretched with like a personalized scarf and you decorate it with images or messages of that connection. So it's kind of like a personalized love letter to your person highlighting, you know, um, just all that they mean to you and encapsulating it as much as you can in images or words. Um, and that's something I started doing in the hospital. And I've had the privilege of seeing families surrounded um, by their loved ones making their individualized hugs and then they exchange them, right? So when I was in the hospital, I'd see them be hung around the hospital room. I encouraged families to mail them in if they couldn't make it to the hospital, which they did. But in my private practice, that's been a big part of one of the legacy projects I do and with this family just recently online. So when their parent died at home, they laid their hugs across um, the parent's body as a tribute. And as I say to families, they can be buried or cremated with their person. So their hug stays with their person forever. So I think so much of this work is simply just about creating a space, right? You know, recognizing with humility, we won't know what to say or do, but following their lead, how do we respond? So. My heart feels so full right now with all these wonderful, beautiful things that you've just shared with us. I, I love the three W's um, and this concept of the hugs. That, that's just tremendous. Um, Elizabeth and, and what a beautiful way of acknowledging the relationships that you have with individuals um, at a time of loss and that you're grieving and, and trying to help them and the story about that the camping you know um, all said and done like although it was you know additional work um, for yourself and many people on as part of the systemic team 
um, within that setting. Um, what a beautiful tribute to that family and honoring what was important for them um, during one of the most painful times in their life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's those little bits of compassion that, you know, it's one thing about humanity that connects us all is we all respond positively to compassion when it's demonstrated and shown and offered. Um, so thank you for, for honoring what's important to people. And through that three W's, what are you wondering about? What are you worrying about? And what are you wishing for? That's tremendous. Um, I hope one day you write a book about these treasures so that your legacy will go on um, one day. And, you know, sometimes in my conversations, I often hear people say, you know, when I say like, what's important to you? What are you, what are you thinking about what you might want for yourself? And I think the most common thing I often hear is I don't want to be a burden. I just, I don't want to be a burden to anyone, which is very selfless. Um, but at the same time, there's got to be something that's important. So you have to kind of dig a little bit deeper. And I'm wondering is, do you have any pointers of how to get around those kinds of conversation when someone just says, oh, well, I just don't want to be a burden and, and encouraging them or prompting them to talk more about it. And then we'll go into sort of the, the final sort of last little bit that we want to talk about. But I'm just curious about how you get past that. Yeah. Um, thanks for asking that, Laurel. And I think it's common from time of diagnosis, right? We see folks newly diagnosed, whatever that is, whether that's cancer or ALS or MS. And you know, the first thing I hear from folks is I don't wanna be a burden to my family, whether it's the range of medical appointments, whether it's the treatment schedule, whether it's the side effects of the treatment, they're so worried about being a burden from the beginning, you know? And, you know, conversely and not dismissing their experience, the family is saying, okay, I've got to be in, you know, I'm, air quotes, be brave, be strong, because I don't want them to worry about me, right? This is about them. So I think there's this universal experience of no one wanting to burden one another, right? So I simply just try to acknowledge and normalize that, right? Um, that it is so common. But what does being a burden mean to you? You know, and what do you think it means to the people you love? Um, and what do you think they're wondering about? Because without fail, and almost 30 years of practice, you know, lots of volunteer practice in that too. I think as I said at the outset, it's it's just constantly learning and, and better understanding how to support people. Um, so I think it's just normalizing, it's so common. I see and hear it from kids when they have a parent newly diagnosed with, a, with an illness, whether that's curative or not, they don't wanna burden their parents. So I think I simply just try to normalize it and acknowledge that it is a universal experience. It's a universal worry, um, but how can we delve into that a little bit more? I think the three W's are a really informal conversational approach to exploring that with people, right? Often when, you know, they talk about being a burden, what are you worried about, you know, in terms of being a burden? What is it that worries you? Because these three W's, I ask kids as well, right? I ask teens. I often even talk to families because I think coming back to your previous question around barriers, communication can be a barrier, right, itself, if we don't delve into some of these spaces and places. So, creating openings to explore what someone's worried about in terms of being a burden for both the person diagnosed with the illness and the family member. And I appreciate advanced care planning isn't just about contending with illness, right? I know there are those acute events. So if we're talking about future planning, you know, what would it mean to be a burden? Um, so I think it's just normalizing it and acknowledging that it is a natural, normal fear, but what can we do and how can we support as healthcare providers across discipline settings and sectors how can we help explore spaces to open up these conversations? Because lots of people say, I don't know how to tell them or I don't know what to say. So simply even saying, you know, I know from my own practice that families worry, often worry about the same things, but in isolation because they don't want to burden one another. Um, so how do we open that up? And some of the kids and teens I work with when they have a parent diagnosed or conversely, the kids or teens are diagnosed. I talk about creating a three W's jar or three W's box as a practice to check in with each other and share their three W's with, with one another, right? Because when we're talking about supporting families going forward, um, how do they first create and honor their own experience together as they move forward? So I think just trying to explore strategies, explore what it means for them. Um, and then, you know, I guess asking as well, you know, about their relationships, because sadly we know many people don't have support Sadly, I also have seen many married couples that could be not, you know, further disconnected from one another, um, where, you know, 
they feel really isolated and alone, even though they're living with someone else. So I think it's exploring what does it mean to them always? What does it mean to the person? And how can we better understand how to support them? Um, and, and find ways that are, you know, I don't want to say make meaning because I don't want to dismiss someone's experience with, with a complex illness, but again, what they wish for, you know, whether that's a conversation with someone they love, whether that's an experience or an event, whether that's sipping their favorite cup of tea out of a decent teacup, you know. Um, I think in my work, I have learned that because I've seen so much illness, loss, dying, and death, that and so much loss and grief, I absolutely appreciate what I refer to as the extraordinary and the ordinary moments. Um, my kids smile, I have three kids. They're 19, 17, and 14. Um, and you know, to hear their laughter, uh, to look them in the eye and, and get a hug. And they're all, they're all super tall. <laughs> so now that you know, my daughter who's 5'10", but my boys are well over six feet to get a really great hug from my kids. Like those are extraordinary moments for me connecting with my breath, right? So as a, as, a, as a professional healthcare provider, I think it's even finding those moments for myself, how I can care for myself in the midst of caring for others who are worried about being a burden, right? So um, just to be able to show up for others to create those spaces. So I think all that to say Laurel is to come back to, it always starts with the individual for me um, and exploring what it means to them. You know, for some people, it might be the first time they've been asked um, for some people, they have a lifelong lived experience of trauma or loss. And, you know, even processing that is a lot to dive into. I think I also remind people, you know, in the different teachings that I do. So whether it's first year medical students at McMaster, which I'm honored to do. Um, I'm also contract faculty at, at Laurier with the um, social work, faculty of social work. I think it's just that reminder that our presence even, even though I'm talking a lot today, <laughs> our presence and silence itself, listening is a gift. Listening is a therapeutic tool, right? Creating that opening. And I remember reading a quote many years ago that said, you know, listening or, you know, silence is one of those places where we can be still and moved at the same time. So really to create that opening for others to share um, itself can unburden someone in the process, right? Of even sharing their story, sharing their worries, sharing their experience. So. I think it's so unique to each person, which is why there's not really a prescriptive answer, but I think it's simply about showing up and creating that opening, leading with humility. I'm so grateful um, to have been able to talk to you about um, advanced care planning and, and so many other things. Um, I'm just really, truly grateful for you sharing your time with us today, Elizabeth. And um, I could see maybe that future down the road that we'll probably maybe have opportunity to do another check-in and, and explore some other areas of advanced care planning with you and palliative care or palliative approach to, to care and, you know, creating that compassion um, and how, and it's, it comes down to it's how we care for each other, whether it's in our personal lives or professional lives um, and in all facets. But um, so I, on behalf of um, the Hospice Palliative Care Association and the Advanced Care Planning Initiative in Canada. Um, I'd like to really sincerely thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us today and sharing your thoughts and, and your just brilliant ideas um, that you talked about. Um, so if you're, if you're comfortable, um, we're happy to share your email with our, our people who are listening. Um, and if you're not, that's fine. We can direct them through ours. Um, so if you'd like more information or to reach Elizabeth, um, you can contact her at, if you'd like to share your email. Yeah, actually my website. Um, so I have a website and that has a link to all my social media accounts. And when I say social media, it is not to share my favorite recipes, although I know food and it's a really great way to nurture ourselves. Um, I use my social media to share free resources um, about education and awareness about all sorts of things um, around you know, serious illness, around loss, grief, but also around advanced care planning. So my website is my first initial. So it's C, uh, which stands for the first name that my parents just wanted me to go by my middle name. So it's C dot Elizabeth Doherty. My last name is D-O-U-G-H-E-R-T-Y consulting. So my website is C Elizabeth Doherty consulting. You're welcome to connect that way. You can connect through my website by email um, and then all of my social media accounts are also listed. So I'd honor the opportunity to connect with anyone. Um, really, again, it's about how we care for one another. It's about the conversations we have in the process. So I'm honored to have this conversation with you today, Laurel. 
Um, but really any conversation going forward about, you know, I remember I had the privilege of meeting Dr. BJ Miller and he talked about the fact that quality of life is not a consolation prize. So how we explore that for each one of us, for ourselves, but for those we love here and now, and certainly for the systems we live in and work in. So, yeah. So thank you so much for that opportunity and for the invitation, Laurel. Oh, you're so welcome. We're grateful to have had you and, and for the opportunity to do so. Um, so for those of you who might like more information about advanced care planning and what we do at Canadian Hospice Palliative Care, you can visit our website at www.advancecareplanning.ca. You can also visit us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, so until next time, everyone out there, uh, please be well and continue to be safe. And uh, we'll chat again soon. Bye.